Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today we'll be taking the introductory lecture for COET Sociology. And uh, in this lecture, we will just go through. In this lecture, we will just see what the syllabus is all about. What are the parts of the syllabus and what exactly is COET asking us with respect to sociology? So I'll take you through the entire syllabus one by one. And it's divided actually in 10 units. And we will see what each unit contains so that you have a fair idea about the subject and you can decide for yourself whether you want to take this subject or not so that uh, this brief idea would be helpful. So starting off with the lecture for today. So we will be starting with unit one and this talks about the structure of Indian society. When we speak of Indian society, as you all know, it's the part, as you all know, Indian society, you are part of the society and you have been in residing in India. So you know what actually is Indian society. However, while taking up this unit, we will be discussing how this society has come to be shaped because of various forces and how the structure has been shaped because of these forces. For any society for that matter, you know, the society actually is born and then shaped because of all the forces that acts upon it. And that gives a peculiar and unique identity to that uh, society. In India, as we all know, it's a very diverse society. Uh, it's a multilinguistic society. It's multi-religious. It's multi-ethnic. So there, are some, there is something about the society of India which attracts people because of its uniqueness of diversity as well as unity how the society of india has come to be about how we see it now so that would be discussed in this unit how the structure of society has been shaped about now in chapter one in, while introducing the society for you i'll be discussing the various forces that has led to its present shape and form as you all know we have had a colonial past we were colonized by various european nations even before that if you see that uh, we had invasions from Mughals, from Sultanate, even before that from uh, Greeks. So various invasions have led to, had led to the society that was there uh, when the modern period started, that is beginning of the 19th century. And that is when the Mughal India was, that is when the Mughal India was at the verge of collapse as you all know and that's when the advent of Europeans comes about. These are the various, uh, they were various European colonizers. For example, you must be knowing there were uh, Portuguese, there were Dutch, there were French and then comes the English. So while taking up this particular chapter, we would be mainly discussing the invasion of the English and how the colonial forces actually went on to dominate us, went on to rule over us for almost about 200 years. This is an important chapter in the history of India, in, in the history of Indian society, because whatever we see today has taken its root in that era of colonialism. As you know, we are right now a modern democratic state. Now, when I say modern democratic state, uh, you know there is a certain constitution, we have a certain form of government, we have a certain federal structure and all these things are because of this impact of colonialism on India because we have inherited most of the uh, modern identity politically, economically from the British rule. However, since this rule, the colonial rule was exploitative for us as a society and Indians were being subjugated, that is why uh, to oppose the rule of colonialism, what took shape? Nationalism. There was feeling in Indians who were being ruled over by the colonial forces for the first time in history of being one people. Why? Because we as a uh, person who were being colonized, were being exploited, we were uh, ruled over by an oppressive force who was not interested in our, uh, in our welfare, rather it was only thinking of the profits and 
how the colonialism or the exploitation can enrich its own coffers. So you would see that colonialism while ruling India gave birth to its own enemy which is nationalism in India. And how did this happen? As you know, uh, when colonial masters were here in India, what happened actually that uh, they, it was impossible for them to bring all the people they would need to run the country from Britain or England. So what they did, did they started education and training of the local population of India. Now what happened? People who got educated in India, they were mostly the people who were exposed to Western ideas of equality, liberty and democracy. Now this was an ironical situation because while getting exposed to these ideas, the people of India, the people who were getting educated uh, uh, and were exposed to the modern ideas of these uh, concepts, they realized that while being the propounders and propagators of such uh, modern ideas, the English themselves were not really fair when it comes to India and when it comes to Indians. And ironically, we were denied the very liberty which England or the English claimed to be the champions of. And while getting exposed to these ideas through education and uh, their stay in the foreign lands, as you know, our initial national leaders were all, and the national leaders like uh, Gandhiji, they were mostly educated and trained in uh, European countries. And from there, they got exposed to all these ideas and they could see the difference between the society of uh, the England, London, Europe, and various uh, Western countries. And they saw the treatment that were being meted out to the colonized people. When you look at the uh, biography of Gandhiji, you would see that he found this uh, irony even while uh, he was staying in South Africa as an advocate. And he actually uh, fought for the rights of uh, people over there also before he came to India. And when he, came, when he comes to India, he finds the same situation. And that is how the whole uh, national movement and the whole uh, idea of this national consciousness comes about when they were exposed to the education and ideas. So the colonial masters, while they were trying to ease off their work by training the local population and educating them, they were actually giving birth to their own enemy, which is nationalism. And as the colonial masters trained and educated these uh, people and they brought in their own modern systems of economy and polity, they created a new class and community which the traditional Indian society did not have. As you all know, our previous society were ruled by kings and princes and uh, rulers were there, princely states were there. So there was no concept of middle class. Only when the Britishers came, there was certain class that was created because of the education that uh, was received by certain class of people. And uh, there were certain occupations that were taken up by people and a different community came up. So concepts like urban, middle class, similarly community, came up in India. We will talk about uh, in detail what exactly do you mean by class and how is it different from community and how is it important in a society, what are the roles and functions of uh, class and community in a society that would be taken up in detail when we will be discussing this particular chapter. So this would be about how Indian society has come to be how it is right now. In the second chapter you would see we would, we would be talking about the population and people of India. That is demographic structure of India. In this we were, in the first chapter we were talking about society as a whole, including its past and its impact on the present population. In the second chapter we would be talking about how a population in India is distributed in a country as diverse as India. Uh, 
demography basically demo word demo means people and graphy means study so in this second chapter we will be actually studying the people of india how are they distributed across regions how are they distributed as per their age and sex and religious and ethnic communities and uh, we would be also discussing about various rates that impacts the population of india most of you would be knowing that india is the second most populous country in the world and uh, we do not have the latest census data yet it was uh, taken the last census data that is available with us is of 2011 and since then population has increased however we still are at the second position after china and to study and make policies for such a huge population you need data uh, even for the welfare even for the welfare policies uh, you need data like birth rate death rate growth rate fertility rate how fast are we growing how much is our population how much will be our population 10 years down the line and how such a huge population has impacted the well-being growth uh, of india and is this population is actually an asset to the India, is it a cause of concern for India? Because managing such a huge population is it in itself is a challenge. However, if you see from a different perspective, it can also be called as a dividend for India. As you know, because of huge population, the foreign uh, companies, most of the foreign companies are interested in India because they find a huge market. There are so many people, they have so many demands that they find a huge market for their goods and that is what attracts the foreign companies to invest in India. Moreover, when you have too many people, that means you have too many working hands. So India has a huge working population, which in itself translates to a huge labor force in India, which is beneficial for the companies because they find cheap labor in India. When you have a large population, you can actually cut down on the labor costs. So, in a way, you can say, moreover, uh, when you talk about population and if you divide the population according to age, then there are young children and there are old people. And in between are the adults, the young working adults. So, India right now has this chunk in maximum, this uh, middle chunk, the working, Indian, the working adults. So, what happens, you know, Young children cannot work, they cannot earn. Similarly, old people do not earn, they have retired and they have their uh, health issues, their physically, physical uh, limitations because of which they cannot earn anymore. And hence the burden, the responsibility of caring for these two cohorts of the population, for these two <coughs> group of population falls upon the middle uh, population which is the working adults so they have to earn they have to take care of the remaining two population so when you have a population which is huge in the middle age group that is from 18 to 60 years of age it's actually a dividend for any country because then your young uh, then your young children and old age people are well taken care of because you have too many adult mature people working so, monetarily it's good, physically it's good. So, this all would be discussed in the second chapter. Apart from this, we would be discussing, as I told you, birth rate, death rate, the fertility rate, how fast and how fertile is India growing. Uh, we would be also discussing about the sex ratio. As you all know, sex ratio means how many male to female are there in India, the population wise. Are females more in India or are males more in India and what are the impact of such a ratio. So, all this would be taken up. Moreover, various theories of population would also be taken. Uh, what has been the growth curve of Indian population? How have we uh, come up to be 1.3 billion as of now? How uh, the growth has been like, has it always been this high or were there periods of stagnation and slow growth? All this would be taken up in the second chapter. In the last chapter, we would be talking about the rural-urban linkages. Now, as you all know, India is majorly a rural country. More than 50% of its population still resides in rural areas, rural India. 
However, because of the various forces of industrialization, modernization, uh, lack of amenities in the rural hinterlands like uh, medical facilities, education, etc., all the amenities are not available in rural areas. Then, also <clears throat> there are job issues. Not everybody is able to find employment while residing in a rural area. So, because of this, the population in urban areas are increasing. You know, all the uh, metro cities of India are already overpopulated, and the urban amenities are not able to cater to them properly. Our urban infrastructure is crumbling. And there are various other social problems that are arising because of this overpopulation. In this chap chapter, we would be discussing all this and how India continues to maintain the linkages between its rural and urban population and what are the points of divisions between these two set of population, how India still remains and manages to continue its linkages to the rural India while being in urban India and how the population is rapidly transitioning from rural to urban and what are the impacts. So this would be your first unit about Indian society. In the second unit, we would be discussing certain social institutions. When I say institution, what do you understand by social institution? This would be discussed. Uh, any institution which is catering uh, to the population, to the people in a certain way along with a proper organization and it has its own set of values then such an institution is called social institution as you know if we uh, talk about a uh, financial institution the one thing that would come to your mind would be banks now if you see bank has a proper organization it has sets of rules and values as per which it works smoothly similarly when you uh, see society there are certain uh, institutions because of which society works in a smooth fashion so we would be taking up these institutions what are those institutions in india the social institutions which are found in society because of which the society comes to work smoothly and how these institutions have changed over the time how do they maintain their continuity from ancient era and how have they changed over the time some of the institutions which we would be discussing, the social institutions would be family. As you all know, we all belong to family. I don't think anybody, anybody you would have met is without a family. So family is a basic primary institution, social institutions, which uh, socializes us, which uh, gives us, caters to all the needs, emotional needs, physical needs, financial needs, every need is being catered to by the family and family has a proper organization you know it's not random there are certain uh, set of rules and values which uh, in which every family actually operates and it passes on these rules and values to the next generation so family is one of the oldest social institution it is the most universal social institutions in no society ever would you find a society where there is no family so it is primary, basic, most ancient, most unique and most universal. So this is family. We would also discuss what is kinship, what is the difference between family and kinship. This would be taken up in this uh, chapter, uh, first chapter of second unit. The second institutions that would be discussed in this unit is caste system. As you know, in India, the caste system is there, which is unique to Indian society and it's not found in any other society all over the world. There may be variations. I'm not saying that there are uh, no uh, system of inequality or hierarchy or the closed society system. But caste system, when you look, it's a very unique thing which is found in India and exact same system is not found anywhere in the world. So how the caste society as a social institution has performed what is it what are the features of caste society what is the difference between uh, the varna the jati goth and how the caste society has impacted different section of people belonging to different hierarchies of the caste how has the state uh, you know taken up the question of caste the hierarchy and the exclusion and inclusion in caste system uh, we would we would also discuss about the various issues 
that certain caste segments have faced because of this caste system which uh, the people who are not placed favorably in the caste hierarchy that is people who are uh, placed at the very lowest level in the caste system or who are termed as outcasts how have they been treated by the other uh, castes uh, in india and all these things would be discussed in this particular chapter we would also see how the caste system despite we being in 21st century and in a modern democratic state still have not been able to get rid of the caste how the system has maintained its its continuity yet and how has it changed over time from 3000 years back the caste we had and the caste we have now the difference how the changes have actually impacted people uh, it has impacted various uh, uh, caste groups inside the caste system so all those all this would be discussed in the caste system coming to the third chapter as you all know uh, in india we also have the tribal society and various tribal groups are part of india if you see uh, in the north uh, tribal societies are there in the hills in the mountains uh, in jammu kashmir himachal if you go uh, there are bakarwals gaddis all these are north indian castes then you come to central india then there are mundas oraus so all these castes uh, all these tribal groups are there all through the india if you go further down south there are different uh, tribal groups and how these tribal groups have been assimilated accommodated in the mainstream society or whether they have been uh, isolated and have been you know given their own space to develop and live like the tribal societies in andaman and nicobar then there are uh, tribal movements also that have taken place from time to time if you see tribes of odisha the tribal groups of odisha they have actually you know protested and got in their rights uh, against certain industrial groups so how do these castes uh, these uh, tribal groups actually operate in india with vis-a-vis -vis the mainstream society how their development has taken place how is their relation with the state the government the protection and welfareism that welfare me measures that have been taken by the state what are the characteristic features of indian tribal society so these would be some of the things that would be discussed in this particular chapter and you would have a better insight with regards to the tribal societies of india the various tribal societies of india and what are their particular problems also so coming on to the last chapter of this unit the market as a social institution when i say market the one thing that would strike you uh, completely is that market is actually an economic institution right Uh, it's like bank. If I call bank a social institution, you would be taken aback. You would be a bit surprised that how is this a social institution? However, when you actually go deeper into the workings of the market, it's actually transaction taking place between two people. One is buying and one is selling. Wherever people are involved, you cannot take off the social element from them. Ah, uh, in India, when you see the market. you would also come across that caste has been operating as a major variable when you talk about market in india you must be knowing uh, since ancient times we had a jajmani system uh, and we had a barter system also we didn't have a proper market market like we have today so how the market system has operated as a social institution also in india apart from being its economic uh, you know uh, dimension the market actually in india has been more of a social institution how the market has been influenced after colonialism the mo modern market that we see now when you go to malls or when you see the markets or there are also weekly markets uh, the hearts are there in villages in tribal areas these are not permanent structures which are there it's just some of the villages who bring their produce to sell on a one of the days of the week and they uh, within 4 or 5 hours of uh, being operating they disassemble 
so how these markets actually operate as social institutions how have they continued uh, their uh, ancient uh, linkages and how is how the market still operates in india uh, with respect to the caste with respect to the indian society and how the international forces have influenced indian market and how international forces have influenced the social relations within the indian market would be discussed in this particular chapter and we would also see the number of changes that market has undergone in india after 1991 that is after the lpg reform that is liberalization privatization globalization and entry of the foreign players in indian market how have they revolutionized this particular institution in india that would be discussed in this chapter so this would be about unit 2 moving on to the unit 3 now when we talk about society for any given society you would see that there is a certain type of uh, hierarchy there are certain segment of people who are excluded and who are uh, disprivileged who are not uh, were given the their due rights to work efficiently as citizens and how various social forces operate to keep them disadvantaged and at margins so in this particular unit we would be discussing this social inequality and exclusion now if you look around yourself by your own experience you would find that with respect to gender with respect to caste with respect to economic class in india there are certain segments of people who are at margins who are disprivileged and who are actually uh exploited by the other privileged classes and caste and you know gender so in india you would see when we talk about gender you would see the problem of patriarchy when we talk about caste you would see the uh caste which are actually outcasts such as dalits then there are backward castes and there are general caste these are the three castes uh, in the caste hierarchy and how these two particular groups of castes have been disempowered disprivileged and exploited through centuries in india and how their uh, status is in uh, society today how the state has helped them you know break the silos of caste system and actually come up and be empowered and what are their burning problems right now how have they been uh, excluded socially economically politically educationally through the various dimensions similarly uh, in india when you talk about as you know india is a multi religious society so when you talk about religion there are hinduism is the major religion 85% of indian population is hindu then there are other minority religions like islam christianity then there is uh, jainism sikhism and buddhism i am including it over here itself because as per constitution of india these group of religion have been included in the broader uh, segment of hindu itself so we would be talking about the minority religions and uh, their exclusion and inequality that they have suffered in india because of they being the minority we will also talk about when it comes to minority apart from religion you have linguistic minority in india people who are divided as per their languages so if you go to uh, tamil nadu you would see that hindi is a minority language or say malayalam is a minority language so religious uh, minority is there linguistic minority is there or uh, as per these minorities what are the privileges being given to them through constitutions through state the welfare policies and what are the different uh, modes of exclusion and inequality that they suffer because of their virtue of being a minority in this particular chapter we would be focusing majorly on religious minorities however i will update you with respect to linguistic minority also uh, in brief the last part uh, of this unit would be the differently abled people when i talk about differently able or people with disabilities see disability in any society is uh, not a very 
you know, uh, not a very integrative thing that any society takes up to be. For disabled people, it is a, you know, marginalization with respect to psychology and social. You know, uh, even if you have, if you have had your uh, uh, circle uh, in your uh, friend circle or in your relatives, if you have somebody who is disabled, the treatment meted out to them is very different from the people who are you know, physically able, I use the term physically able and physically disabled because it has meaning in it. So, how physically disabled people, uh, despite being, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to cope up with life because of their physical disability, are also struggling with the exclusion and inequality at the hands of larger society and how things have not been made easy for them and they are not you know, holistically integrated in the society as they should be, as in any other normal person should be. So, how do they suffer this uh, exclusion? How this harassment has been to them? And what have been their issues? What are the state policies, reservation, and how has state enabled their integration in the society would be discussed in this particular chapter. Uh, one thing that I missed out is tribal communities. Uh, we, uh, we, while uh, talking about caste, we would also be talking about the tribal communities as you, as I have discussed in the previous unit also. The tribal communities in India have also been excluded, uh, marginalized and sometimes they have been assimilated also so much so that you are not able to differentiate the tribal uh, people from the other people. So, this particular segment would also be discussed and what have been their dimensions of exclusion, how have they suffered because of this, how have they suffered because of the development uh, and industrialization in India and what have been their issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis state, vis-a-vis -vis other people and how their development should be henceforth. Are they demanding the development or are they happy in the way their life has been? What exactly is the meaning of development to them? The different connotations of development to them? And have we taken care of the tribal society in India as far as the mainstream society is concerned in comparison to that? Have tribal people been given their fair share of development returns? So this would be discussed in this particular chapter, the marginalization of tribal communities. So this would this was your third unit. Moving on to the next unit. Unit four. This talks about challenges of unity in diversity. So at the start of the lecture, I uh, had told you that India is a very unique society because of its diversity. You see diversity with respect to religion. You see uh, diversity with respect to languages, with respect to ethnicities. So religion languages, ethnicity, caste, uh, region, gender. So these are the various dimensions of diversity that you would find in India and among these with respect to caste, religion, language and ethnicity, even region for that matter, India holds a very unique place in world and nowhere else in world would you find so much of diversity in, in, a, uh, in just one country. So in that way, India is unique. And the commendable thing for India is uh, why we should study the diversity in India is that India has held on to its diversity and has maintained the unity also. So that is a very unique feature that despite so much of diversity, how has India managed to be a successful democratic modern society which is which it is today you know there are problems in india we are not denying that but despite all the problems despite every challenge that diversity can throw upon a nation india has held on to the unity for last uh, uh, 70 75 years after the independence and that's commendable uh, however, in this uh, particular unit, we would be also discussing problems that are being brought because of this diversity. There is problem of communalism when we talk about diversity with respect to religion. There is problem of regionalism when we talk about diversity with respect to region. There is problem of casteism and there is problem of patriarchy with respect to gender. So, these diversities has also been 
an issue for India because we are on a continuous basis. As you see, we are struggling with uh, pro issues of minorities. We are struggling with various riots. With respect to regionalism, there have been demands of separatism. And there has been movement like Khalistan movement. Then there is insurgency in India. There is also the uh, Naxal movement in India. So these are the challenges that India as a society has faced because of its diversity. Then with respect to casteism, we have various issues with respect to uh, problems of the oppressed caste. There have been caste violences. There have been caste politics. Last, uh, about the patriarchy, we would be talking over here the gender issues. Because of patriarchy, the problems being faced by the women of India, uh, the issues like domestic violence, rape, uh, dowry, uh, the low sex ratio that you find in India, female infanticide, maternal, maternity mortality rate, all these are issues because of patriarchy. So, we would be discussing all these things in this particular chapter. With respect to same issues, we would also be discussing the role of Indian state, that is Indian government in dealing with these problems. How Indian government has dealt with the issue of communalism, the regionalism, how India has been able to maintain the various demands of separatism and it has brought around uh, the various <coughs> parties, political parties and groups within its hold of larger democracy. And how is it still trying to maintain it as a nation despite various, you know, uh, insurgencies and issues, internal security issues in various parts of India. With respect to casteism, uh, what are the laws, policies, rules in India that would be discussed. And with respect to patriarchy also, various laws uh, which are there in favor of women to prevent uh, these various violence issues. Uh, the abysmal sex ratio, uh, infanticide and uh, you know their safe their safety at workplace and in public place all this is being taken care of by the state and how the state has been able to do it would be discussed. In the last we would be talking about what we share as a society. What is it that has held Indian society together despite all these challenges, despite all these problems? And what is that one thing that binds us? What is what are the ethos, the consciousness, the cultural values, the constitution, the government, the police forces, armed forces, everything that we as a society, as citizens of India, we share would be discussed in this particular chapter. So this would be unit four. Coming to unit five, we are midway through the uh, syllabus. Coming to unit 5, we would be talking about the process of social change in India. As you know, India is an ancient society. So, it has been, uh, you know, impacted by different social changes. And how has these changes brought in the structural change within the uh, society of India? What do you understand by structural change? Any society for that matter is uh, organized in a certain way. When you talk about, uh, see, uh, I'll give you an example of social institution like caste. Now, caste has a certain structure, like Brahmins are at the top. Brahmins are at the top, then there are Kshatriyas, then Vaishnavas, then Shudra and the outcast. So, this is a certain structure of a social institution. And how this structure has undergone change because of various uh, forces, because of various uh, social changes in India would be discussed in this particular chapter. Here we would be discussing the impact of colonialism on India. We would be discussing the impact of industrialization and urbanization. So these have been the major forces because of which the society of India has undergone change. The structural change, the cultural change as would be discussed in the second chapter. of Structure means the entire structure of the society is, uh, has undergone uh, change and has undergone the upheaval that was brought about because of these forces. In cultural change, we would see how India has changed culturally. Like now we have values of modernization. What is meant by modernization? How has it changed a society like India, which is 
uh, ancient society and uh, which has had the problems of you know uh, blind faith the old faith uh, old rituals old religion and how the modernization has been able to keep up with pace with a country like india the society like india then there are other uh, forces like westernization and sanskritization so these are some of the interesting terms you would be discussing in this chapter these were given by an eminent sociologist m m n srinivas these two terms and uh, how these forces have operated what do you understand by these forces what is the difference between modernization and westernization as value and how these both forces cumulatively have impacted indian society would be discussed in this particular chapter and also secularization <clears throat> as you know india is uh, you know basically a religious society we have multiple religion in india and people profoundly hold on to the religious values we are deeply religious people in such a society how secularization has been able to make its place and how has it ha helped the society uh, that would be discussed in this particular chapter in the last chapter we will be discussing the social reform movements and laws see for any society to stay relevant and to stay uh, uh, young and to keep pace with the development all around the world it has to undergo certain changes uh, it has to get rid of the values which are not serving it anymore it has to imbibe the values which are useful in the present day and age and how does a society uh, do this you know it's difficult to let go of old values and system and culture and it's difficult to uh, make peace with the new trends and new changes that come up in uh, society in the world so for this we as a society have experienced certain reform movements and where did they start uh, what was the section of population towards which this was aimed at these reform movements how did it take it up what are the laws that were brought in because of these reform movements would be discussed in this particular chapter we would be tracing all the reform movements starting from the 19th century till the latest reform movements and uh, there were caste movements there were uh, women movements there were religious movements reform movements so the, all this would be discussed in this particular chapter so in this chapter we had seen how the indian society has experienced change and what were the reasons for these changes in the next section we would be seeing social change and polity how indian society uh, in the previous chapter we saw the cultural change the structural change now we will see the political change how constitution as an instrument has been a device of social change how uh, did the things written in constitution the fundamental rights the uh, state policies the duties in uh, constitution of india the preamble of indian constitution the judiciary that operates because of the constitution the various safeguards the privileges that are being given within the constitution to different section of people who are marginalized how all this has brought in a change in indian society with respect to this we would also be reading what are political parties what are pressure groups what is democratic politics you know democratic politics is something in which everybody participates in the polity this is not like the ancient system of the raja maharajas jahan pe uh, raja aur unke mantri gar koi decision lete the the ministers and the ruler would be taking a uh, particular decision and that would be followed by the Uh, population the rest of the population the praja so in the democratic politics everybody participates in the policy making the decision making and that is when we say it is a democratic politics how these pressure groups have been able to exert pressure on the government and how because of them uh, various policies have taken shape various laws have come about in india similarly the political parties have been formed some of the pressure groups which organized as political parties to take to participate in the uh, government has been uh, impacting indian society that would be discussed in this particular chapter what are political parties when do you call a particular party or a pressure group as political uh, what are the various criteria on which we uh, decide which is a national party which is a state party 
and how do they come about so all that would be discussed in this particular chapter the last chapter would be discussing the panchayati raj i think uh, very few countries in world have this grassroots level democracy where governance has actually been brought to the last tier in india there is three tier governance system as you would be knowing we have a parliament at the center we have legislative assemblies at the level of state and then we have panchayati raj and urban local bodies for governance at the last level the grassroots level of villages and cities and towns so uh because of this particular uh, there was uh, there was amendment 90 uh, nine, uh in, because of certain amendment the panchayati raj was brought in and the three tier system of government was brought in to uh, you know democratize the whole uh, way of governance and to make people more a part of governing system and how has been its impact as you know the panchayati raj system also has a uh, provision of reservation for various uh, groups of people like uh, women uh, the certain caste group certain tribal group and because of this reservation there have been a enhanced participation of such communities and groups in the policy making in the politics of the country in the governance of the country apart from this because of uh, this reservation these section of people have come to know about their rights the things that they are entitled to and they can demand from the government so the whole politicization has taken place very rapidly with respect to uh, panchayati raj and urban local bodies governance and hence this has brought in the social transformation however there have been certain challenges in operating these panchayati raj system and it has not yet uh, fully achieved the goal for which it was set out to be and would be discussing all these challenges in this chapter in seventh unit we would be talking about social change and economy in the last unit we talked about polity previous to that we were bit, we were talking about the structural and cultural changes and now we'd be talking about the changes that have been brought in indian society because of its economy uh, as you know after independence india when you actually first we'll talk about the rural society economically what are the changes that have been brought in rural society as you know previously we had the zamindari system that is before the independence uh, we had rayatwari system we had mahalwari system in which certain section of people who were not even working in the lands in the fields were given so much of power and privileges uh, over the peasants and farmers so the whole economic system changed after independence because of land reforms then in 1960s and 70s we saw the green revolution which made india self sufficient with respect to food grain production and how has this impacted economically and socially the indian society because of green revolution there were certain states which took uh, benefit of the green revolution and were able to earn more vis-a-vis -vis other states and how agriculture was completely transformed because of this green revolution and actually became commercial so these would be things and agrarian society uh how the whole entire agrarian society have been you know reclassified uh, into the uh, the middle class farmers the upper class farmers the peasants the landless laborers so all these would be discussed in this particular chapter in second chapter when uh, this was rural then you see the rest of india and urban area there was industrialization and liberalization initially uh, after independence till 90s we had planned industrialization we used to have five year plans and uh, india was mostly tilted towards a, a socialist society even though we had a mixed economy but the tilt was towards socialism and hence most of the industries and sectors of industries were within the government control and government hold and because of this the industrialization in india has been very planned you know the industries that were set up by the government in india the motive was not profit making the motive was uh, modernization development and employment so from there how did we go to the 1991 lpg reforms that is liberalization privatization and globalization reforms 
what were the reasons that we had to go for LPG and uh, from a closed economy we became an open economy and the foreign players were introduced in the Indian economy, the foreign industries were introduced and uh, the foreign uh, companies were taking up the sectors, the industries which were previously held by government. So what changes have been brought because of that in economy and how that has impacted Indian society would be discussed in this particular chapter. In the last chapter, we would be discussing about the class structure, how Indian society, apart from the caste uh, that it was divided into, now it has also been divided into the class. And that has been because of the impact of economy on the society. So uh, how many classes do you see around yourself? If you, you know, look beyond uh, yourself and you see around, you will see people belonging to different class. Somebody would be very rich. Uh, he, he would be upper upper class, then there would be upper middle class, there would be upper lower class, then again there would be sections within the middle class, then there would be lower class, then there would be poor. So how these classes have come about in Indian society, what are their complexities, uh, how homogeneous are they and what are their problems that would be discussed in this particular chapter. In the last uh, in the 8th unit, we would be talking about some of the new changes, new arenas of social change. We call them new arenas because these are the latest uh, forces that have impacted Indian society and has brought in the social change. Uh, if you see, uh, we will be talking about the media and social change. Uh, the latest to be coming is social media. As you all know, the social media has impacted Indian society a lot. However, in this particular chapter, we will be talking about the print media, television, radio and the impact of, uh, along with a, a part of social media and the impact it has, in, uh, it has on Indian society, how Indian society has changed uh, its way of looking towards certain uh, traditional practices that it followed, how the things have changed, the perspectives have changed and how social change had been transforming for India as a society from a, a feudal ritualistic society to a modern society, from a traditional to a modern society. And what have been the problems associated with these new forces? Second is globalization. As you all know, we are now an interconnected village. If you look uh, uh, around yourself, you would see that no country is very far. Or you can take a flight, you can get connected through media, you can get connected through internet and uh, the whole world has come out to be a small village, we call it global village and because of this various countries, various communities, uh, various states have been exposed to different ideas, different cultures like we are now more exposed to the European culture than our parents were. We are now more exposed to the uh, African culture, the Japanese culture, the Chinese culture vis-a-vis -vis our previous generation because of this globalization. We can now go and stay in Australia. It is not all that difficult as it was 50 years down the line. Uh, in fact, even without going to Australia or England or Europe, you can actually work for the companies settled over there uh, through internet and uh, you know the back offices of certain MNCs are there situated in India and Indian, uh, Indians have been taking up the customer care calls uh, for people residing in other countries. So this is how connected we are and how the globalization forces have impacted Indian society as a whole and what kind of social change has that brought in vis-a-vis -vis different sections of people. Has it been good? Has it been bad? Or is it a mixed bag that would be discussed in this particular chapter and unit. Moving on to the last unit that is unit 10. We would be talking about the various social movements in our uh, seventh and eighth, uh, in our seventh and sixth unit. If you remember, we talked about the various lines along which Indian society is actually divided. And uh, with respect to these particular classes and castes, there have been certain movements which have impacted Indian society, which have impacted the society that were marginalized, and it has also impacted the society which were exploiting these particular communities. So 
in this particular uh, unit we will first discussing in the first chapter class based movements now if you see uh, every society is divided into classes economic classes and based on that there are workers there are peasants there are industrialists there are landholders so these are the privileged bunch who actually exploit these two communities and extract as much labor as possible to make profits so there have been uh, movements the working class movements because of uh, these exploitative practices by the privileged class and what have been these movements would be discussed in this particular unit similarly there have been caste based movements uh, as you know the uh, present uh, certain political parties like bsp sp have been brought because of certain caste movements that happened previously so what were these movements they have been taking place uh, even before independence and uh, what was the need for these caste based movements have they been successful in achieving what they set out to and what have been the impact of these movements like dalit movement backward caste movement and what has been the responses of the upper caste when these uh, movements were taking place and have uh, upper caste taken to these movement uh, kindly or has there been you know a push back against these movements that would be discussed in this particular chapter then uh, we had also divided society along the lines of gender and uh, we talked about the problem of patriarchy so because of that we also had women's movement there have been waves of women movement in india and how these women movement have uh, actually impacted the society is uh, india now a more progressive society with respect to gender with respect to its female is it more caring is it more inclusive that would be discussed in this particular chapter then tribal movements would be discussed another uh, criteria of uh, division in indian society was tribes and the mainstream society and there have been tribal movements even uh, before independence against britishers there have been tribal movements you must be knowing certain movements like kuki revolt there was uh, uh, santhal revolt birsa munda revolt so all these were tribal movements we discussing in this particular chapter how these movements have shaped the indian society have shaped uh, the experiences for the tribal community for the mainstream society for the state government how have they interacted that would be discussed in this particular chapter and last we would also be discussing the environmental movements as you all know environment is a very burning issue right now for uh, the entire world the entire globe however certain movements in india took place to protect environment from the forces of uh, what should i say industrialization because you cannot industrialize the entire planet it has its costs and uh, the costs are mostly borne by the people who are at the margins who are poor who are uh, you know lower in the caste rung who are tribals who are women so in india to push back against these developmental policies of government there were certain uh environmental movements that took place for example there was chipko andolan there was apiko movement in southern india so these movements would be discussed in this particular chapter so this was it with respect to your sociology syllabus uh, that would be coming in your coet exam and uh, this was a broad guideline that would help you choose whether you are interested in this particular subject to pursue a course or not and i hope this was informative and would be beneficial in making the right choice for you uh, we'll be taking up a, these lectures these units in detail in our further lectures so thank you and all the best